This is the Addiction 101 talk. Has has anybody here heard this previously? Okay, so you're just stuck having to rehear it. Um, so the reason that I do this particular talk, Addiction 101, uh, is because it is very clear uh, from the way that we treat addiction that we don't understand it. The society doesn't understand it. The healthcare providers don't understand it. We just we call it a disease, but nobody really bothers to explain why it's a disease. Um, we know diabetes is a disease because people either don't make insulin or can't utilize what insulin they have. We understand that high blood pressure is a disease because blood vessels are constricted. So we understand the mechanisms behind other disease processes, but nobody bothers to explain to us the mechanisms behind addiction. And I think that if we're going to treat it, uh, we need to understand it. And so um, when, when someone who's diabetic chooses to eat a piece of chocolate cake, knowing that their blood sugar could become elevated, that they could have a, go into a coma or have a seizure, and then they do that, they choose to do that, and then let's say they die because of a result of their choice, nobody talks about how their kids are better off. Like they made a bad choice and their kids are better off. But every time an addict chooses to use and they overdose and they die, there's somebody in the wings wanting to talk about how their kids are better off and they're just some sort of junkie. Um, so I think that that speaks a lot about how we really understand and perceive this disease. Um, the other problem I have and that I think is important to educate people about is this concept of the opioid epidemic. Um, there's no such thing as far as I'm concerned as an opioid epidemic. There's the epidemic of addiction and it has existed for all of time or at least the last 200 years. Uh, it's just a matter of what specific drug is being used and that we're fixated on. Um, and I think that we basically, uh, it's like a, that whack-a-mole game, you know, where you bop one down and then um, the next one pops up. And, and what we need to be focusing on is the machine, how to unplug the machine, stop the disease process as opposed to focusing on each specific drug. Um, and, and just to prove that point, I mean, in, in the 80s, we had the cocaine epidemic where a lot of women were pregnant and they were having, losing, uh, they were having a lot of fetal demise because of cocaine use. Um, so we started enacting, I think, some federal legislature or something to stop that. Um, and then in the early 2000s, we had methamphetamine. There was the Combat Methamphetamine Act where we started having Sudafed available over the counter at Walgreens. You need your license now to get cold medicine. That was because of the methamphetamine epidemic. Um, and then right after that, we had bath salts. People were eating people's faces. It was like a zombie apocalypse, right? Um, so we made those illegal to buy at truck stops, and now we have some better urine drug testing for that. So my point is we just continually focus on the drug and try and get rid of that drug, and then the next one pops up in its place. Currently, we're seeing a huge rise in methamphetamine, probably because we've been so focused on opiates. We've had opiate task forces, opiate conferences, opiate everything. Um, and now that opiates have the spotlight on them, people are shying away from them people are starting to use methamphetamine again. Um, opioids have been around forever. Uh, in the 1800s, there was a morphine epidemic. In the 1900s, there was a heroin, prescribed heroin epidemic. Uh, and then in the 50s to the 70s, uh, there was another illicit heroin epidemic, but it affected prim primarily minority populations. So we didn't pay as much attention to it as we probably should have. Uh, and then the 80s was the cocaine, meth, bath salts, opiates, now meth again. So the word addiction comes from the Latin meaning to impose sentence or to give over into slavery, which is interesting when we consider what actually is happening in the brain of a person who has addiction. In the medical world, in order for something to qualify as a disease, it has to fit into the disease model. So the disease model essentially says that there is an organ, there's a defect in that organ, and then there are symptoms because of that defect. Right, so diabetes, the organ is the pancreas, the defect is the decrease in beta islet cells, the symptoms are high blood sugar, coma, eye disease, kidney disease, et cetera. Uh, it, you know, a broken leg is a, an acute disease state. The organ is the femur, the bone, uh, the defect is a fracture, and the symptoms are pain, bleeding, screaming, deformity, whatever. Um, so the question becomes, if we're calling addiction a disease and we're comparing it to other diseases, how does it fit into this model? Because it has to if we're going to call it a disease. So to start, it's a brain disease. So it's a neurological disease. So we're already at a disadvantage because we don't understand the brain very well. Um, 
And we also know that every behavior, every thought, every emotion we have comes from our brain, right? So it's fair to say that a disease in that organ could result in symptoms that simply affect our behaviors, our thoughts, and our emotions. We know this to be true because we know that there are certain brain tumors that occur where the only symptoms are complete change in personality. Uh, there are tumors that occur in certain areas of the brain where uh, the person becomes aggressive, impulsive, um, unable to weigh consequences, unable to look at future planning. They become very, very different uh, from what people know, and, and ultimately it's discovered they have a tumor. But there was no headache. There was no visual problems. It was simply a matter of behavior and personality change. So the two parts of the brain that I think everyone needs to understand in addiction um, are the frontal cortex and the midbrain. Okay, and obviously the brain is very complex and there are multiple other areas of the brain involved in addiction, but I think that as a non-addiction specialist, it, these are the two parts that people need to really understand. So the frontal cortex is the part of our brain that makes us us. That's our personality, that's our intellect, that's our values, our morals, um, our spirituality, our willpower, our ability to make choices, our ability to rationalize and justify. That's all frontal cortex. Okay, so that's where our skills are, our superpowers as humans. So if you happen to be really skilled at playing an instrument or you're really good at statistics or you're a great athlete, those skills are built over time in the cortex. So there's pathways built up in the cortex that, get, that lend us the ability to be good at that skill. So that's the frontal cortex. The midbrain is the survival brain. So it's completely subconscious. You have no control over your midbrain. Um, this is the life or death processing station. So essentially, um, this is the, the part of the brain that activates when you're being chased by a bear uh, or something, your life is in jeopardy. The midbrain has three functions in normal humans, and that is to remind us to eat nutrients and drink water uh, kill off or run away from predators, and then procreate for perpetuation of the species. And FYI, I don't have permission to use these pictures, so I'm just letting you know. Um, <laughs> when a baby is born, one of the first things we do is we feed it. And we do that because nutrients in food or breast milk or formula, whatever you're giving them, will activate the reward system in the midbrain. And it triggers the midbrain to recognize food as a pleasure-producing agent that is necessary for survival. And so we essentially get addicted to food as babies. It's necessary or, or we would have died off as a species. Drugs work in the midbrain. So drugs, when I say drugs, I mean drugs of abuse. So every drug that people could potentially abuse or do abuse falls into this category. So that would be your opiates, your cocaine, your meth, your other stimulants, marijuana, alcohol, barbiturates, benzos, right? So anything people are potentially abusing ha work in the midbrain. And we know this because in the 50s, we believed that addiction was a moral failing. We believed it was uh, had to do with a cortex problem, essentially. So Dr. Olds um, took a bunch of mice and stuck little probes into their brains. And mice don't have a frontal cortex. So mice don't have like consciousness and ethics and morals, right? But they have a cortex where their skill sets are. And they put the little probes in the mouse brain and they let the mice hit a lever to administer cocaine to themselves. And they found the mice didn't want the cocaine. And so they, were, they thought, oh, we proved it because mice don't have morals and ethics and so they don't get addicted to drugs like humans do. But mice have tiny brains and mistakes are made in a laboratory and one of those probes got pushed too far into a mouse brain. And that mouse brain, that mouse would now hit that lever and hit, give itself cocaine over and over and over until it died. It wouldn't eat, it wouldn't play with other mice, it wouldn't do anything that mice are supposed to do. So essentially it was acting like a human addict. It was sort of ignoring all of its responsibilities as a mouse in order to continue to get cocaine and it did so until it died. Uh, and that probe had been pushed into the midbrain. So that was the beginning of the neurobiology of addiction. That was how we started studying it. So mice essentially get addicted. They get addicted to substances, but yet they are not from bad homes. They don't have, you know, um, gods. They don't have gangs. They don't have bad parents. So, you know, the idea that this is a cortical problem sort of went by the wayside for scientists, but not so much for society. 
So what happens in addiction is that when someone repeatedly uses a high uh, pleasure producing substance like drugs, um, for people who are predisposed, so people who have a genetic predisposition for addiction, repeated use of that substance essentially rewires the brain and hijacks it to believe that drugs, so high pleasure producing agents, are necessary for survival. So for someone who's never been addicted, uh, the example I always use is if you're in the desert and you're on day five with no water, so you haven't had water in five days, you're literally dying, your kidneys are shutting down, your liver's shutting down, you will not make it another 24 hours. And I offer you a bottle of water, but I tell you, if you drink this water, I'm going to take your kids and I'm going to put you in jail and I'm going to take away your bank account and your job. There is not a person on earth who's biologically capable of refusing my water. Because in that moment, when you are literally about to die, the midbrain is active and the midbrain is driving you to survive. You would take the water, you would satiate your midbrain, you'd say, okay, we're going to live another 24 hours, your frontal cortex comes back on, and you're smacked in the face with the guilt and shame of having given up your family and your freedom and your life for a bottle of water. Then you probably try and spend the next hour manipulating me into giving you your stuff back, right? Um, this is what happens in an addict's brain over and over and over on a regular basis. So this, I put this slide in here because I really think people need to understand that addiction is a disease in the brain. People can use drugs. They can even use a lot of drugs and still not have the disease of addiction. They can just be really bad drug abusers, okay? Um, and these people make it very difficult for me and people that work in the field because everyone wants to believe that they can just stop that they can just put it down and walk away and that willpower and strength is all that it takes. Um, but for a true addict, someone who truly has these neurological changes, that is not true. They cannot do it. Um, so I, I call this guy Uncle Marty and I says he comes to Thanksgiving dinner and says to you, I used crystal meth every day for 10 years and I just put it down and walked away and I just made work and my family my priority and you know, you just need to have a lot of willpower and strength and you can do this. Um, so, I, you know, I think that everybody knows somebody like that, and every addict wants to be that, but that's not the reality. And I put in this stoplight because I, I do want people to understand this concept of willpower, uh, and, and I, this, I'll come back to this later, but essentially uh, willpower works like this. It's a frontal cortex function. If I am at a red light, my foot is on the brake. Willpower keeps my foot on the brake because I know if I go through, I'm physically capable of driving through a red light. But if I do, I could cause an accident, I could hurt myself or somebody else, I could get a ticket, there are consequences. So willpower says I'm not allowed to do this, so I'm not going to go through this red light. Once that light turns green, all the willpower in the world is irrelevant because I have permission to go through that light. And so willpower is rendered useless when the brain has essentially given itself permission to do something. So, and again, I'll come back to that later, but... Um, if I were to take this Uncle Marty and I were to take someone with true addiction and put them in a brain scanner, particularly a PET scanner, um, probably functional MRI would work too, uh, the addict will show activity in their midbrain when we show them their drug of choice. Uncle Marty will show activity in their cortex when I show him the drug he was using. So this is obviously a very expensive test, and we're not going to be doing this on everybody who's using drugs to see if they have true addiction or not. And the truth is that can change. Uncle Marty might start drinking alcohol two years later and become addicted to alcohol. Now he has true addiction. Now if you put him back in the scanner and showed him crystal meth, his midbrain would light up instead of his cortex. So this can change over time, but essentially you can tell the difference between someone with true addiction and someone who's just abusing drugs. Uh, these are functional MRIs that if you go on Google and you Google brain on drugs, you get a picture of the frying pan with the eggs, remember that? And then you get these pictures. So these are not from any patient of mine. But essentially what they're showing is in a non-using brain, the cortex is very active. It's all that red. Uh, and then in the cocaine addict, you can see that there's way less red. It's a way less active cortex. Uh, and for anybody that's not familiar with these functional MRIs, basically we're looking down on someone's head so their nose is at the top of the screen. So it's that front, that top portion, that's the frontal cortex. 
Uh, and then in the, in the other image to your right, um, what we're looking at is a normal brain activity uh, and then a, someone who uses cocaine 10 days after they stopped using cocaine and then 100 days after they stopped using cocaine. So this is someone who has true addiction, whose brain has changed because of their chemical dependency or their chemical use. And you can see that even after 100 days of not using, their brain doesn't even look close to a normally active brain. So this is why when an addict gets clean for a week or two weeks and they go, well, I don't feel any better, I might as well be using anyway. Um, yeah, it takes a long time. And if we were to continue this out untreated, just stick them in a jail cell and not actually treat the addiction but keep them abstinent from drugs, it could take up to two years for their brain to start looking normal again. This is the midbrain. So this, um, this shows that in the midbrain, there is dopamine receptor activity. That's what the red is in the control um, column. So the red is dopamine receptor activity. So then in an addicted brain, you'll see there's way less dopamine receptors, right? But the really important part of this slide is that you'll notice it doesn't matter what the drug is. They all do the exact same thing. Right? And we could even continue that with all of the addictive drugs. Benzos look the same. Uh, marijuana looks the same. Uh, Adderall. You know, all the addictive drugs look the same. So addiction is basically a broken reward system because that's what's in the midbrain is our reward system. So it's a broken pleasure sense in the brain. So this is how our brains work. This is like still this is like simplified times a billion, okay? But in order for us to think or feel or move or do or behave any, in any way, what happens is we receive a signal from the environment, either an electrical signal or a chemical signal. So electrical signals are things like touch, smell, taste, hearing, vision, right? Um, chemical signals are things like food, drink, and medications and drugs, okay? So we receive a signal. That signal comes in and it activates a nerve cell. It activates a neuron. And what it does is it tells that neuron to release neurotransmitter. So neurotransmitters are things that our brains actually make, the chemicals that we make in our own brains. So each nerve cell is like a little factory and it's building its own neurotransmitters. So we got serotonin, we got dopamine, we got glutamate, we got GABA. There's a whole bunch of them. And it's making these neurotransmitters and storing them in little vesicles and, and holding on to them until it gets an activation from some sort of signal. So that signal comes in and it says release neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter then is released into the space in the brain and it finds the next nerve cell that has receptors for it and it jumps on those receptors. So if I'm walking down the street and I see a hole in the ground, I receive an electrical signal from my eyes, right, sight, I see the hole, and that electrical signal travels down, travels down a nerve cell and it says release acetylcholine, for example. And so the, neur the neurotransmitter acetylcholine gets dumped into that space and the next nerve cell that's available that has acetylcholine receptors, grabs that acetylcholine, and that is what sends a signal down to my leg that says, take a step. So I step over this hole or whatever. Okay. Again, simplified times a billion, because even when you shift it in your seat microscopically, that's a result of this occurring at like a million times a second because you had slight discomfort in your seat, basically. Um, but this is how our brains work. So this is really important because number one, it says that we require that the originating nerve cell have a receptor for that stimulation. So if I use heroin and it gets into my brain, but there's no receptor for heroin on that nerve cell, that nerve cell will not be activated by the heroin. But the effect comes from the neurotransmitters. So I could use heroin, it activates the first nerve cell, the nerve cell releases the neurotransmitter, the neurotransmitter is what determines what effect I'm going to have. So essentially, it doesn't matter what the originating signal was. What matters is the neurotransmitter that's released. So if I use alcohol, my brain is going to release several different neurotransmitters. Some of them are going to be the ones responsible for how you feel when you drink alcohol. So intoxicated, less inhibited, silly, funny, romantic, angry, whatever people feel when they drink, that's the result of certain neurotransmitters. However, alcohol also releases high levels of dopamine, which is a pleasure chemical. The dopamine works in the, in the reward center. 
the rest of the neurotransmitters work in different areas of the brain. If I use heroin, it's going to release some sedating chemicals. It's going to release some energizing chemicals for people that get energy from opiates. Um, and it's going to release dopamine, cocaine, dopamine, and acetylcholine, and norepinephrine. So my point is, all the abusable drugs are going to release multiple neurotransmitters. Some are responsible for how someone feels, but the dopamine is responsible for the brain recognizing it as a pleasurable chemical. And that is at a subconscious level in the midbrain. So we have 10 perceptual systems in our brain. We have vision, hearing, touch, smell, taste, which most people are aware of. Um, six through nine are for people that like physics. And then 10 is the pleasure construct. So we, pleasure is a perceptual system in our brain necessary for survival. We cannot survive as a species if we do not enjoy anything ever, okay? There'd be no reason to get out of bed. There'd be no reason to do anything. Um, but really, even at that basic level, we feed a baby when it's born because we need nutrients in order to stimulate the pre pleasure center in their brain so that they will continue to crave or desire food so that they can thrive. Okay, so it, it has a biological function, um, our pleasure system. And dopamine is the pleasure chemical. So dopamine is the neurotransmitter that says, I love this, I want to do this again. So in order for you to enjoy anything in your life that you enjoy, it, dopamine had to be, be released at an appropriate level in your brain to register that this was an enjoyable event. So if you go on vacation to the same place every year with your family, it's because that vacation spot released enough dopamine for you to say, I love this and want to go back again. Because there are 6 billion places in the world you could go on vacation. And the fact that you keep going back to, you know, Camp Hiawatha or wherever says it's not the place. It's what that place did for you, for your brain. So we have a set point in our brains for pleasure. So uh, in order for anyone to recognize something as enjoyable, enough dopamine has to be released in the brain for that brain to register it as pleasurable. So it has to reach that, thresh that threshold. Um, there are some things here that are kind of standard. I mean, I think for most people falling in love or having a baby, for most people, will release enough dopamine to say this is a pleasurable event. Um, but then there are individual things. Certainly someone who plays an instrument or is very good at playing at music, um, that's because they get enough dopamine when they pick up an instrument and play it that they want to continue to do that. Drugs release huge amounts of dopamine, far beyond anything that's natural, okay? And so um, essentially the brain keeps getting flooded with these unnaturally high amounts of dopamine. And when the brain is flooded with too much dopamine, what it says is, hold on, there is so much dopamine available. We do not need all of these receptors for it, right? Because it's always here. And so it starts taking away receptors. It downregulates dopamine receptors. But now that there are fewer receptors, what that means is we need more dopamine to feel the same amount of pleasure right? Because there's not as many receptors around. So now the brain actually needs more dopamine to feel normal. So the threshold moves. The threshold for pleasure actually moves. And now playing the guitar or doing math or whatever it is that you enjoyed before still releases the same amount of dopamine it always did. But it's no longer enough to cross the threshold and be recognized by the brain as pleasurable. And this is why addicts and addicts' families will often say, he used to love to do this or that, or she used to do this all the time and never does anymore. This is why addicts will also tell you, I don't use to get high anymore. I use just to feel normal, right? Because legitimately, it's impossible to feel normal if you can't feel any kind of pleasure or joy. Stress is a huge player in this because stress... True chronic stress uh, looks almost identical to addiction in the brain. So when someone experiences chronic and severe stress, and again, they have a genetic predisposition for this, they will release a hormone called corticotropin-releasing factor, CRF. When, when we have high levels of CRF circulating in our systems, our brains respond by taking away dopamine receptors. 
I don't know why that is. It's an evolutionary trait. I'm sure somebody can explain it, but I don't know. But that is what biologically happens. And so for anybody that was listening five seconds ago, that's the exact same thing that happens when you have addiction. So someone who's experiencing chronic and severe stress uh, is going to start experiencing a similar thing to addicts in that they're unable to experience joy or pleasure like normal people do or from things that used to give them joy and pleasure. So why is this important? Well, ultimately, we know that because this is doing the same thing, people who have addiction, one out of every four addicts has a history of trauma. So someone experiences trauma. They don't have the skill set, maybe their children, they don't have a skill set to deal with that trauma. So they develop, that's chronic and severe stress, right? So they develop this problem of decreased dopamine receptors, and they don't know there's anything really wrong with them except their life is maybe a little bit off. And then someone gives them a joint or hands them a beer when they're 10 or 11, and they drink that or they smoke that, and for the first time in their life, they feel normal. And so they continue to seek out that feeling, that that normalcy. Uh, And then the continued use of the drugs exacerbates the problem in the midbrain. So then they continue to need more and more dopamine. So now they're also addicted. Now being addicted is a chronic and severely stressful state because you're always worried about where you're going to get your money from and your drugs and you're lying to your family and you can't hold a job, right? So now we have chronic and severe stress. So, So it becomes a vicious feedback, negative feedback cycle. Um, On the flip side of that, if one out of four addicts has a history of trauma, what about the other three people that are addicts? What about those guys? Well, they don't start out with the chronic and severe stressor. They start out with the substance use. You know, uh, college, high school, they drink with their friends. Maybe they have a higher tolerance. They have the genetic predisposition. They happen to use a substance the number of times required to trigger their genes, and ultimately they become addicted. And now their addiction becomes chronically and severely stressful for them, and, and on and on and on. So we have the same exact cycle over and over. So basically, addiction is a stress-induced hedonic dysregulation, but the stress-induced part could be from the addiction itself. Okay. So here's the way it works, and I'm not a microbiologist or geneticist, okay? So this was explained to me by a microbiologist in simple enough terms that I could understand. So basically, in order to have addiction, you have to have a gene for addiction. Have to have a gene for addiction. It's just like with lung cancer. If you don't have a gene for lung cancer, you could smoke 80 packs of cigarettes a day and never get lung cancer. You have to have a gene that has to be activated. Most people do have at least one gene for addiction. It goes back many, many generations, and I think the actual statistics somewhere around 65 to 80% of all people have at least one gene for addiction. Some people have more than one gene for addiction. What activates that gene can differ from person to person. I might have a gene, and again, this is simplified a billion times, but I might have a gene for addiction that's turned on by 10 alcohol drinks where someone else might have an addiction gene that's turned on by 75 opiate uses, okay? We don't know which gene we have. Could be turned on by one alcohol use. Could be turned on by one opiate use. You don't know. And so ultimately, until that substance is used in that amount, that person is not going to develop addiction. But once they do, once the downregulation of dopamine receptor starts, now all substances are a problem. Okay, because now all substances that release high-level dopamine are going to be interpreted by the brain as necessary for survival. And so this becomes very problematic in the example of, say, I have a patient who drank alcohol for 10 years every day and then stopped. And he said, oh, you just need willpower. You just got to stop drinking, be strong, focus on your family. You know, you don't have to drink. So he puts down the alcohol, walks away. Seven years, works a job, fully functioning, not using any substances, doing really well. Then he needs knee surgery. And he goes and gets a knee replacement. And the doctor prescribes him a normal amount of Percocet. And he takes the Percocet for his knee pain, and it helps. And for the first couple of days, the amount of Percocet he takes is appropriate for the amount of pain he has. Then on day three or four, as the inflammation starts to subside, the Percocet is slightly more than what he needs, but it's what he has. So he takes it. And then he starts to realize that the Percocet is helping with his kind of stress and his depression. And it helps him deal with his in-laws better. And it helps him deal with his kids better. And it helps him sleep and whatever. It has benefit. And so he says to the doctor, yeah, I think I still have pain. You know, I think my pain's still there. I need a little bit more. So he gets more and more. 
And then, and then we all know the cycle. Then he gets cut off. He finds friends that have it. He can't get that anymore. He gets heroin and so forth. So he winds up on detox with me. And I say, I'm going to detox you off the heroin, uh, but you can't ever drink again. You can't ever use any other substance again. And he says, oh, Dr. Labor, you don't know what you're talking about. I drank every day for 10 years. And I put it down and walked away. Alcohol's not a problem for me. And a year later, he's back on my detox unit, and he can't stop drinking or using heroin. Um, and that is because it was the opiate that actually activated this process. But once it started, again, all substances are problematic. Glutamate is the other neurotransmitter that I like to talk about because glutamate is the most abundant neurotransmitter in our brains, and it is responsible for memory. So every time something good happens in your life and dopamine is released, glutamate is right there like the executive assistant writing down how awesome that was, okay? And glutamate is such a good assistant that it keeps track of events around the pleasurable activity. So the first time someone uses a Percocet, Dopamine is released and glutamate says, Percocet is awesome. File that away. And the next time they're like, Percocet came from the guy in the pharmacy with the white coat. White coats are awesome. File that away. Pharmacies are awesome. File that away. The pharmacy on the corner of the, and so forth and so on until ultimately, you know, Route 75 is awesome because that's the route they always take to get to their dealer. Okay. So glutamate is responsible for sort of laying down that memory. And this is also the reason why when you're going to Camp Hiawatha for the eighth year in a row, you're starting to get excited about going even when you're just packing your bags, right? The excitement comes even before you leave um, because glutamate is sort of reminding you, you're going to get some dopamine soon. So relapse in humans is caused by three things. It's caused, one, by dopamine release. And this comes in two, usually one of two forms for most people. Um, first, healthcare. Doctors don't understand addiction any more than anybody else. We get no extra training on addiction at all um, unless we seek it out. So physicians have the same misconception as most other people in that, oh, you're addicted to alcohol, so you can have Percocet for your gout, or, oh, you're addicted to heroin, it's okay for you to have Xanax for your anxiety. So they don't understand the dangers there. Um, and so that's problematic. And then uh, obviously there are times where certain medications are necessary, right? So somebody's having a heart attack, they go to the emergency room, they're going to get fentanyl. That's the standard of care right now. Fentanyl is a very high dopamine releasing agent. And so someone with a history of addiction who gets a shot of fentanyl when they're in the hospital is at very high risk for relapse. Does that mean that they shouldn't get the fentanyl? No, of course not. It's the standard of care and they're going to die of a heart attack. So they need to get that fentanyl. It's important. However, just because it's necessary medically does not make it any less dangerous or scary or potentially relapse producing. It's just it needs to be weighed along with the, the risks and the benefits of, of that situation. If someone's having a seizure, they need Ativan. Will that put them at risk for relapse? Yes, it will. But will it save their life in the moment? Yes, it will. And therefore, it's necessary. But where, you have to, where we have to look at, at um, where this is appropriate or inappropriate is someone that comes into the emergency room with a sprained ankle does not need Dilaudid or Percocet if they have a history of addiction. If they come into the ER with a panic attack, they do not need Ativan because these things will not kill them. A sprained ankle and, and panic will not kill someone, but the Ativan or the Percocet or whatever they're given could potentially kill them because it could lead to a relapse. So we have to look at the, the risk-benefit ratio. Um, and the other area where this happens is family, well-intentioned family. It's not always like some peer pressure type thing, but you know, a family, a, a family member who says, oh, you, you've been clean from heroin for six months. You could have a glass of champagne at your cousin's wedding. You could have a beer with your dad watching a football game, right? That's kind of where they um, where they don't understand that a drug is a drug. And so they think, well, this is less dangerous, and so therefore it's okay. And the addict who's not really invested in recovery is going to say, yeah, okay, that sounds good, and then, then they're at risk for relapse. The second area where um, relapse occurs is stress. Anybody that knows an addict who ever got clean and then relapsed, what do they tell you? Mom died, dog died, lost my job, spouse left, right? There's some sort of stressful event. Uh, and then the third thing is, is triggers, people, places, and things. Addicts will, you know, can, can be clean for three months, go to the Circle K to buy some milk, run into the guy with the blue hat that, that, that used to sell them drugs. And if they don't use that day, 
they're going to be restless, irritable, and discontent for the next two to three weeks. And they're not going to know why. Why do I feel so off? Why do I not feel right? And the reason is the, the midbrain believes that it needs this high-level dopamine for survival, right? It's incorrect, but that's what the actual disease process is. Um, so how does it motivate the individual uh, to repeat these behaviors? How does it take that soccer mom or that kid from the really good family and motivate them to behave in the shady ways that we know addicts behave? And the answer is craving. So craving is not like, oh, I'm pregnant and I want chocolate, which is legitimate, but not what I'm talking about here. Um, I'm not pregnant. I'm saying when I was pregnant, I was craving chocolate. Sorry. Um, <laughs> But craving is the awakening of the midbrain. So craving is when that midbrain wakes up and says, we need water or we're going to die when you're in the desert. Okay, that's, that's what craving is. It's suffering. It's the brain saying, oh my God, I don't feel right. We have to fix this now. Okay, and the addict, again, because the midbrain is at a subconscious level, the addict is not going... I feel like I need some dopamine because I really think that I'm dying here. What the addict feels is something's wrong. Something is wrong and I have to fix it and I can't get away from it. And, and I think that the only time that I think a non-addict can really understand what that feels like would be some sort of really incredible discomfort. Like if somebody was like blowing in your eyeball and you just like, I can't focus on anything except getting away from this sensation. Like it, it absolutely overwhelms and distracts a person from being able to think logically or do anything else. That's what a craving feels like. And the choice argument has always been addicts have a choice because if you put a syringe full of heroin in front of a heroin addict, but you put a gun to their head, they will choose not to use the heroin. So therefore, they do have a choice. And, and it's not a terrible argument, but, but I think that what it doesn't take into account is one, that the midbrain can prioritize levels of threat. So the midbrain is able to say a gun to my head is more dangerous right in this moment than not getting that dopamine. Um, and it doesn't take into account how that addict is going to feel for the next day, hour, two weeks, month, which would be restless, irritable, discontent, and just not right. So even just seeing that heroin and having the option to use it but not doing it will put them in a state of complete discomfort where if they're not working any kind of active recovery program, they're going to use over it. So once this craving sort of sets in, what happens is, remember, you were in the desert, you're dying, your midbrain is active, your frontal cortex is shut down. Your frontal cortex contains all of the information and files about you, right? So everything about your life is contained in your frontal cortex. So the midbrain is awake like a ninja. It sneaks in there and it goes through all your files and it looks for the thing that's going to make it okay for you to use again, right? Then the craving passes. Cravings pass always, right? Either time, about 10, 15 minutes, or with use of a substance, it will pass. If someone's actively using, it'll come right back like a minute later. I mean, they're constantly having cravings, but it does always pass. Once that craving passes and that cortex has a moment to come back online, the thing that's staring it in the face is the thing that the subconscious brought to the consciousness, which is that thing, that permission. And this is where we have the red light, green light, willpower. So when someone says willpower is all you need, willpower is what kept that person clean up to that moment. But once the brain says, you know what, we have really terrible pain, we need to take opiates, uh, we can't function without, you know, in this much pain, or hey, you know what, I have to support my family and I can't support my family if I can't work and I can't work if I can't sleep. I need to take an Ambien to help me sleep, right? That red light just went to green. Now they have permission. They gave themselves permission of what they believe to be a legitimate reason to use a substance. So willpower is rendered useless. It's inactive, right? So um, this, is where, this is where I, the willpower argument fails. And now that there's a reason, at least in their mind, that's where we start to see the behaviors that we see, right? I have to sleep, I have to take an Ambien, but my wife won't approve it, so I have to lie to her. Or I have to go to different doctors to get different medications because nobody's gonna give me what I really need. Or I have to steal my grandma's Xanax because nobody will prescribe me Xanax with my history or whatever. So this is where we start seeing these shady behaviors that we see. But what we don't see is all the stuff leading up to this. We don't see the 
the down regulation of their dopamine receptors, their intense need to feel better and different. They're, they're wanting to feel normal, right? All we see is lying, rationalizing, justifying. And I'm not saying these things are okay and that we should say, oh, well, he's an addict, so it's okay that he lies. I, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we can have compassion for why they're doing these things. There still should be consequences for, for things, but certainly with a degree of compassion for why it's happening. And then this is super fascinating to me about addiction is that once, once the disease is established and once the behaviors surrounding the disease are established, those behaviors start giving people the same, a similar sort of pleasure. So it's that glutamate, right? It's keeping that file. But that means if I'm a drug addict and I take a drug every day to feel better, then I start associating the instant gratification that comes with using a drug as pleasurable which means now I will only want things that are instantly gratifying. And so instant gratification starts to become associated with pleasure in that brain. Taking a pill to fix a problem starts becoming associated with pleasure in the brain. So when addicts, come, my patients come to me and they say, uh, why can't I take Tylenol PM to help me sleep? I say, because it's not the Tylenol PM that's addictive. It's the behavior of needing a pill to do something your body can naturally do that's the problem, right? There are only 11 people in the world that have polyinsomnial familial disease, which is the disease where you can't sleep and you die, right? None of them are in the U.S., I don't, I don't think. None of them are my patients for sure. So that means everyone is designed to sleep. Now, some people, like me, you say sleep, I'm out. That's it. It doesn't take any more than just a directive to do so. But other people struggle. They have anxiety and their brains race and they, they are restless and maybe they have pain issues and there's other things going on that make it difficult. That's not fair. I'm sorry. Life is not fair. A diabetic is not allowed to eat those cookies or chocolate cake, right? It's not fair. Part of your disease says that you can't be taking something every night to help you sleep. It's, it's not appropriate because your brain will recognize the need for that pill as part of that instant gratification and, and behavior. Looking for reasons to avoid recovery-related activities becomes linked with pleasure. If you tell me to go to uh, an AA meeting and instead I go to my dealer's house and get high, my brain links getting high with avoiding meetings and therefore will continue to avoid things that are appropriate. This is why when you say to an addict, you need residential, and they're like, nope, not doing that, that's probably the thing that's going to help them the most. Right? If you say you have to go into treatment, no, I, I'm not, I, I have a million excuses for why I can't do that. It's because the brain is actually actively fighting against that suggestion because it associates anything that might take it away from using as being bad or dangerous or scary. Punishment doesn't work right? because taking the drug out of the system will quiet the midbrain. It will get the midbrain sort of the threshold back to normal, but it does nothing for creating the skill set necessary to deal with stress. Okay. So I'm going to skip that. So basically the, the treatment for addiction is to treat the cortex. We have to build up the skill sets that somebody needs in order to get well. Okay, so remember I said, you know, you, when you work on something over and over, you get a strengthened uh, neural co connection, right? If you want to play an instrument or whatever. Well, coping skills are skills. Stress relief is a skill. And every time someone uses a drug to deal with stress or to cope with a situation, the pathway for behavioral coping gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And so eventually, you take away the drugs and something stressful happens. They have nowhere to go. They don't have that skill set anymore. It's weakened. And so essentially, they wind up reaching out for a drug again. So the treatment for addiction is to rebuild those pathways, to build up the coping skills and the stress relief skills in the uh, cortex. So the traditional treatments, that's what they do. Residential treatment, intensive outpatient treatment, individual counseling, 12-step um, meetings, these things all work on the frontal cortex. They all work on building of these skill sets that are necessary. That is what is necessary for every addict that wants to get well. Medications work in the midbrain. They don't work for every addict. They don't work for certain substances. 
Um, but they have a role in quieting the midbrain so that we can focus on the cortex. So they, they serve a very specific purpose. So essentially the goal of treatment is to restore the cortex. So what we have to do is we have to help the addict sort of extract um, meaning from things outside the drug, from things outside the world of drugs. So as an addict goes along using and their, their skill pathways are decreasing, um, they are, their entire uh, sense of self becomes associated with that world. Right, so they become they and the drug become interdependent, and they t they they'll tell you the drug is my best friend, it never lets me down. Right, they isolate from other people because they don't want to hear about how they shouldn't be using, but that drug never lets them down. And so, um, and then they develop this sort of sense of self associated with it. Addicts will tell you first time uh, I ever brought I ever bought heroin from a drug dealer, I met them in a Burger King parking lot at two o'clock in the afternoon because I didn't want to get shot in the head by a drug dealer. And by the end of the addiction, before I got help, I was meeting my dealer in the darkest alley I could find at 3 o'clock in the morning because I didn't want the cops to find me. So how does a person go from A to B? I mean, that seems like a very, very different scenario. But that's because the continued use sort of becomes their normal. That, that world becomes their normal. And then they identify themselves as part of that world. And that's where they're most comfortable. Dopamine is the comfort chemical, right? It's where we feel most comfortable when we're getting dopamine. So, and, and, you know, you can see this phenomenon. It's very interesting. If you go to a rehab center, go out into the smoking pavilion and listen. The addicts, the drug addicts, think they're better than the alcoholics because they are more hardcore. And the alcoholics think they're better than the addicts because they only used alcohol and they never did drugs. And the IV drug users think they're better than the pill users because they're more hardcore. And the pill users think they're better than the IV users because they never use needles and that's dirty, right? Now, I think to any logical person, that seems all very bizarre, right? But to them, that is, that is their whole world and their identity. Their entire identity and self-worth is wrapped up in the world of their drug use. So the goal is to give them new self-worth, give them new self-esteem, give them a new sense of identity associated with non-drug things and the non-drug world. So we give them coping skills. We teach them stress relief. We help them develop social supports that are not just family. Family that's supportive and not using is great, but it is never going to be sufficient because they are the first ones to say, Oh, well, at least he doesn't have a needle in his arm. Who cares if he's smoking pot? Okay. Um, and not only that, but even if they can understand, even if they heard my lecture and they say, no, Dr. Labor says all drugs are bad, you can't do it. They still don't know what it feels like. They don't know what it feels like to have that craving. Okay. So having other addicts in their life that are not using is very, very important as part of the social structure. Safe environment, so important. Number one complaint I get from EMS is uh, got a call out, someone overdosed, went out, picked them up, gave them Narcan, brought them to the ER, ER stabilized them, sent them home. Two hours later, we get called out again, same person, overdosed, gave them Narcan, brought them back. They're frustrated. And my first thought is always, I'm sorry, the ER stabilized them and sent them where? back to the same environment where glutamate told them that they get a whole bunch of dopamine and were shocked that they used again? That makes perfect sense to me. Safe environment is so key because it is, so, it is such a trigger, right? Um, and then the most important parts and the quickest way to build up skill sets in the cortex is through spiritual growth and personal development. And spiritual growth, I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about um, the growth of spiritual principles like trust, integrity, hope, discipline, love, you know, those kind of spiritual principles, learning them and incorporating them into one's life, finding their place in the universe, their purpose in the universe, that kind of thing. Doing that very, very rapidly helps build up these skill sets in the cortex. And so that's the most effective way to, to give someone something that's more emotionally meaningful to them than, than the drugs were. So the purpose of traditional treatment is simply to strengthen the cortex while the midbrain is active, right? That's the whole purpose. 12-step programs are great for this because they are just spiritual growth for dummies. They give you a recipe like baking a cake that if you follow exactly as they say, 
will give you a cake at the end. They will give you some sort of spiritual and personal growth. So that's why they're really effective if they're followed 100% of the time. Um, most people are sort of forced to go to 12-step programs, so they go and they don't get anything from it because they're not actively working through the steps, which is what the program is. It's not just going to meetings. Um, but that's the quickest and easiest way to get this. It's free. It's an hour a day. Uh, it doesn't require that you go to live in Tibet for a year with a monk to do some personal ex exploration, which would be awesome if everybody could afford to do that, but they can't. Counseling is important too. However, individual counseling is very, very rarely successful on its own for treating addiction. And that is because I don't care how good of a counselor you are, you cannot out manipulate an actively using addict. They are the most manipulative people on earth. And if they still want to continue to use, but have you reporting to their PO that you're, they're doing great, they will find a way to make that happen. Um, group counseling, very effective because an actively using addict cannot out manipulate a group of other addicts. Okay. Um, counseling though, individual counseling is very important for the whole treatment process. I'm not discounting it as important as a modality. I'm discounting it as the only modality. It should not be the monotherapy. Um, but a lot of addicts want to say to me, well, first of all, they don't want to go to group therapy. So we know group therapy is going to work, right? Because they don't want it. Um, they all want individual counseling. So again, we know that it's probably not going to work by itself. Um, but they'll say things like, if I could just get to the root of why I'm an addict, I think that I could fix this. And I say, you don't need to know how to make a donut in order to eat a donut. You don't have to know why you're an addict to fix it. In fact, you have to fix it first. Because if you try and sit in counseling and go down and dig into your trauma and you think that you can deal with what you find without using, you're out of your mind. It's not going to happen. And doing individual counseling and doing a lot of that work will actually cause relapse over and over and over unless you already have the skills to deal with stress and trauma that don't involve using first. So individual counseling is super important as after you stopped using and you've got some skills. Over time with either abstinence or a steady state of dopamine, the threshold will go back down to normal. Or close to normal. If someone is using a steady state medication like buprenorphine or methadone, the threshold will come down to slightly higher than normal, but still within the range where normal activities are pleasurable. Okay, and that's because it's the spikes of dopamine that are the problem. It's this constant spiking of dopamine. So over time, this threshold does come down, but it is friable. So it, it, what that means is it may have taken 10 years for this to happen in the first place, but now with every exposure to high-level dopamine, the threshold's going to start moving again. So even one use could prompt this threshold to start moving again. So an addict can drink that glass of champagne at their cousin's wedding, and they may not immediately fall into a, a relapse, but what they're going to find is that they become a little bit less likely to go to their meeting or call somebody that is in their support group, and they sort of start distancing themselves. They're restless, they're irritable, they don't know what's going on, and then they have another glass of beer and, the, and so forth. And so over a period of time, they wind up, getting further and further away from recovery and closer and closer to a full-blown relapse, and then they relapse. So um, that's why it's important to understand that, you know, uh, one use really can trigger a, a whole cascade of events. Um, process addictions, I think I mentioned because it always gets asked. Um, so the process addictions are the, the behavioral addictions. So gambling, sex, shopping, video gaming, um, that sort of thing. So these are slightly different than chemical addictions in that they are not interchangeable. So if you're addicted to alcohol, you're also addicted to meth, even if you've never used meth, right? Because they all do the same thing. For the process addictions, not everyone is subject to getting the high level of dopamine from those behaviors, uh, even if they're an addict. So one addict may uh, get a huge amount of dopamine from gambling, but another one will not. And, and, but that addict may get a huge amount of dopamine from exercising or shopping. And then they find out that gambling or exercising excessively or shopping gives them pleasure. And so they get stuck on that behavior. And as they continue to do that behavior problematically, their threshold stays there. Then one day they run out of money or they lose their house or something 
terrible happens, they can no longer engage, they break their leg, they can no longer engage in that behavior. Well, now their threshold is stuck up there. They haven't been doing anything to really work on their coping skills. And so as soon as something stressful happens, they go back to using, right? And so, and this is not to say that someone getting clean shouldn't exercise. They should exercise. But if they're exercising four or five hours a day and they're doing so at the expense of not going to work or paying their rent or doing anything that they're supposed to be doing, that's a problem. This is also the reason that we tell addicts in recovery no relationships for the first year. Not because we're trying to be difficult or mean or we want them to be lonely, but because nothing produces high, higher amounts of dopamine naturally than love. Lusty, beginning, pheromonal, chemical love, right? Um, and they, this happens a lot. They go, they, go to, they go to their meetings, their AA meetings, and they've got three or four weeks clean, and they're kind of miserable because they haven't been using drugs, but they can't biologically do anything that gives them any dopamine. And then across the room, they spy their soulmate, and they make eye contact, and they talk after the meeting, and, oh, my God, we have such a connection, and this is the first person I've ever talked to that's also not using drugs, and so it must be healthy and good, and we have so much in common, and we're, like, meant for each other, and then we're going to go to meetings together, right? And so they become each other's support system. Neither one of them super healthy uh, at a month clean. Um, and, and so they don't do any of the other things because anybody knows that, I mean, anybody who's ever been in a relationship the first few months, like you blow off your friends, you blow off everybody except that person, like that's your focus. And so that's what happens. And then a few months later, it becomes norm, a normal relationship where you actually start to realize you have other things in your life and that person has flaws. And so the relationship is not producing as much dopamine anymore. And then something stressful happens and you have no skills for it. And so they wind up using again, right? And that very, very commonly happens. So that's why we're always very like stringent about that rule. It's not to be mean. It's because we know that biologically that has a huge impact and potential for relapse. Medication should be used to stabilize the midbrain. A drug doesn't cure a drug problem, right? And, and there is no one pill that fixes everything. And so ultimately, the idea of medication is simply to stabilize that midbrain so that we can focus on the cortex. It does, we, we don't have a medication for meth use or cocaine use. We don't have a medication for um, marijuana. We only have medications for opiates and alcohol. But they can be very helpful and useful tools, provided that they are done in conjunction with all the other things that are necessary. Am I going till now? Am I done? Or do I have 10 more minutes? Okay. Um, so per- essentially the role of medication is the opposite. It's to quiet the midbrain when the cortex is weak. When the skill set is weak, we have to actually quiet the midbrain. So why is this important? Uh, 89, 90 years ago when Alcoholics Anonymous was founded, you had a bunch of um, older gentlemen, probably in their 60s, 70s, somewhere around there, who lost everything because of their drinking. They lost their careers and their wives and their families, and they have tried over and over and over to get, to get sober and had been unsuccessful. And so when they walked into a church basement and a bunch of other older gentlemen said to them, sit down, shut up, and listen, we're going to tell you how to stay sober, they had a gift. They had desperation. I've lost everything in my life and I I don't know what else to do. So I will go ahead and listen to you. Even though my midbrain is active, even though I'm craving a drink, I'm going to go ahead and listen to what you have to say because I don't know what else to do, right? That's why it was very effective. Today, we have 19-year-olds who are snorting Vicodin for six months, lost their job at Taco Bell, mom won't let them use the car, and now they've caught some charges, right? So... They don't necessarily understand what desperation is. Yes, they don't want to get in trouble. Yes, but but the true that true soul level desperation, they don't necessarily have that. And that is one of the reasons that the these epidemics we look at are problematic. Heroin does bring people down quicker, right? So before they've had the life experience to become desperate they start having problems. And so getting them to go to a church basement and sit down and shut up and listen to a bunch of older people who maybe didn't use heroin is very difficult. And But if we can quiet down that midbrain, if we can quiet that angry tiger long enough for them to sit there and listen, 
then we, we might be able to help them. And that's really what medications can be helpful in doing, is sort of that carrot to get people to sit down and start working on that cortex. So the medications we use, obviously, uh, there's a bunch of them. But for alcohol, there are ants abuse, which makes people vomit if they drink. Uh, Camprol, which is an anti-craving drug, and naltrexone, which is the pill form, and Vivitrol, which is the injectable form. These all reduce cravings, okay? Well, except ant abuse. Ant abuse just makes people vomit, and so then they stop taking the ant abuse. They don't stop drinking. Um, but Camprol and naltrexone um, reduce cravings. So statistically, there's a significance in the, in the amount that someone drinks. Um, it's not always, to me, it, it's not always beneficial, right? So obviously in medicine, it has to have statistical significance. So if someone's drinking a 30-pack a day and they take naltrexone and they're down to a five, pack, five beers a day, statistically, that's significant. To me, there's no difference, right? Drinking every day is drinking every day, and ultimately, they're going to wind up back at a case a day. However, if someone gets out of rehab, they're not drinking anymore. They pick up a couple of weekends in a row and they're worried, I'm going to start drinking all the time again. Now, Trexone Camperol can be really helpful with reducing that, the, the sort of binge pattern. For opiates, we have three choices. We have a full opiate, we have a partial opiate, and we have an opiate blocker. Um, and they all serve a different purpose and they all have a role in this. And, and everybody is different in terms of what is most appropriate for them. But there is no one that's better. And I think a lot of people really want to focus on naltrexone or Vivitrol because it blocks opiates, right? So Suboxone has some opiate in it. Methadone has a lot of opiate in it. And so they have withdrawal coming off of it. They can abuse it. They can get high if they use too much of it, right? So, so there's a lot of like pushback for using those. But naltrexone is just a blocker. It just blocks the ability to get high if someone uses an opiate. But what people don't take into account is the fact that they're still not working on their cortex with any of these, Right? But you give somebody a shot of Vivitrol and they walk out of your office, you don't see them again for 30 days, there's nothing holding them to going to treatment. There's nothing holding them to going to group or counseling or doing what they need to do. And there's nothing stopping them from using Xanax or meth or any of the other substances. So none of these by themselves are good. They are all very good when used in conjunction with actual treatment programs. So the definition of addiction is a broken reward system due to stress that results in loss of control, which is acting like a fool, craving, and persistent use despite negative consequences, right? Got to have negative consequences or there's no reason to stop using drugs. Um, but negative consequences can be anything, can be social, relationships, physical health, uh, financial, any kind of consequences. And I always say that, you know, if a loved one says to you, I'm worried about how much broccoli you eat, I think it's dangerous, You'd probably stop eating broccoli because you care about that person and who cares about broccoli, right? But if someone says to you, I'm worried about how much you drink or I'm worried about the amount of marijuana you smoke and you continue to drink or smoke marijuana, then basically you're saying this substance is more important to me than your concern as my loved one, as my family member. To me, that's a problem because if you don't have a problem with a substance, it shouldn't be a problem not to use it, right? So I, I think that that could fall into persisting use despite negative consequences. You could potentially lose the support of a loved one to continue to use a substance. How is that not a problem? So essentially the organ is the brain, right? Specifically the midbrain and the frontal cortex. The defect is a broken reward system, a downregulation of dopamine receptors, as well as a decreased overall functioning of skill sets, right? Decreased uh, coping skills, stress relief. And the symptoms are loss of control, craving, persistent use despite negative consequences. This is no different from any other disease. And I would venture to say that if we were to uh, continue this out and say untreated disease, what happens in untreated disease? If you were to put cancer. Everybody likes to compare addiction to cancer, right? If you were to take cancer and ride it all the way out, untreated, what happens? There are cases of spontaneous remission. There are cases where people can get well, even if they're untreated from cancer. With addiction, as far as I know, there's none. If they have true addiction, it almost inevitably leads to death. And so I would, I would say if you were going to create a hierarchy of diseases, addiction is one of the worst. It is one of the most dangerous and potentially fatal diseases if left untreated. I don't put them on a hierarchy. To me, a disease is a disease, and we're going to treat them all. But I think that, that that's important to know because people do like to do that.
And ultimately, a, a combination approach is the best. We want therapy. We want groups. We want treatment. We want medication, you know, if it's appropriate. The, the combination, when done correctly, is the most important thing. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to say this. Marijuana releases dopamine in the midbrain. That's it. That's the end of that story. So for an addict, it's not an option. I don't care if it's medical or prescribed or off the street. CBD is a different story. I'm not talking about CBD. I'm talking about THC. So specifically, anything with THC molecules in it is not appropriate for an addict. That's the end of that discussion. For a non-addict, it's no worse and probably better than alcohol, which is legal and people use all the time. An addiction is a family disease, and it is a family disease because the addict foc- or the family focuses on their addict the way the addict focuses on drugs. So the addict becomes the family's drug of choice, and that's codependency, and that needs to be treated the same way. And essentially, in my experience, the only people that don't think 12-step programs don't work are the people that are still using or, you know, like I run into them in detox for the eighth time. They say, oh, that 12-step program doesn't work. And I say, how do you know what works? You're here in detox again. And ultimately, the goal is to prevent addiction because we're not going to treat it to extinction. But I think that, you know, educating ourselves and learning about the disease process and treatment is probably the best way to start that process. But prevention is really where it's at. Thank goodness we have a prevention department, so I don't have to have answers for that. But, uh, yeah, so that's it. Does anybody have questions? I think what we can do is uh, open up the break period right now. So we've got 15 minutes before Dr. Thomas is going to go on. So we will start promptly at 2.30 just okay. because of how strict they are. I like being able to answer questions. Yeah, but so. as well, if people just want to stay and uh, listen to any questions that come up, that's an option. Also. So I won't be offended if you get up and walk out <laughs> to use the restrooms. But, yeah, does anybody have questions? Now's your chance. You don't want to miss her being able to answer some of these. Sugar. Yeah. The worst. The worst of all of them. Sugar. No, honestly, I, I think that there, I, there's actually a book called the, the Case Against Sugar. There's a book called that, and it, it's actually very well done. Um, it's not about addiction, but it is about sugar. And sugar causes so many medical problems, um, and it does act in the brain very, very similar to these. It releases dopamine in the reward center, um, which produces a, an out-of-proportion craving for it, um, and then the use of it to continually you know, suppress or deal with emotions. I mean, it works just like a drug, but it's simil- It's more similar to nicotine in the idea that it's not like you're probably not going to walk like two blocks in the snow to look for a half-eaten pastry on the ground in the parking lot of the Circle K to get some sugar, right? I mean, it's probably not going to happen, but for a cigarette, you would do that, right? Um, well, not you, but I mean... As people who smoke. Um, so, I mean, the degrees of addiction sort of, we, we sort of do look at that, that spectrum. But because of the long-term problems that it causes, it's, again, like nicotine. It, you know, it doesn't cause immediate problems so much. But long-term obesity, diabetes, hypertension, I think heart disease, there's a lot of diseases linked to increased sugar consumption that politically and financially we have... Um, it's best if we don't talk about it and link it sort of like a lot of things in this, in our country. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of financial motivation to keep the evidence about sugar suppressed. Um, but it's not healthy. And if you've ever tried to go without sugar for like three or four days, I mean, legitimately like reading labels, no high fructose corn syrup, no sugar, it's painful. It's like, it's like the flu. You feel really bad. It's not as bad as opiate withdrawal, but it's pretty bad. Um, and then you feel great for days and days. You feel great not eating sugar. Like oh, you have so much energy and you're not, you don't have the drag and the lethargy and then something goes wrong and you're like, Oh, I'm at a family function. I'll have a cookie. And then that's it. And then all of a sudden you're back on your regular amounts of sugar, right? No other food does that. I don't, I don't, I don't eat broccoli and then be like, Oh yeah, I want to eat broccoli every day. Right. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I know there's some people love vegetables, but I not probably like they love sugar or like people love sugar. So it's super dangerous. It is, it is definitely an addictive chemical and it definitely has a lot of problems. 
um, and can be used in moderation. There's really no benefit to sugar nutritionally. There's really not much benefit. Like it's not doing anything nutritionally or health-wise for us. It is an enjoyable indulgence, and I don't think that people should be like, oh, I'm never eating sugar again. But for most people, the ability to do that, to just, it's like people who can smoke a cigarette a week or two cigarettes a week. Like that's bizarre, but there are people who can do that. That's really how sugar should be consumed. So I, um, I don't know what the term was, but the behavioral addictions. Yeah, the shock, process addiction. Yeah, yeah, process. Are those? Is there any linkage between that and people more susceptible to alcoholism, or is there any correlation with the two, or not really? Or? Uh, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I don't think any. I don't think I've ever looked. Addiction. No, okay. no, no. It's not. It's a good question, but no, it's generally not. Um, people who have process addictions as their primary addiction, meaning that's the only like addiction they've ever had, there is, I don't think there is any higher number of them transitioning into drug addiction. And if they do, there's more of a tendency to slide back into the process addiction. So they kind of get stuck there. Uh, almost like, like eating, like an eating disorder, um, you know, which we know is mental health, but there's also an addiction component to that. And I find that if somebody has an eating disorder first and then starts using drugs, then it's actually a lot harder to treat them because you have to treat the eating disorder first. So if somebody had a gambling addiction first and then became addicted to drugs, I think it would be really important to focus on the the gambling addiction first um, because without it, then they're always going to go back and forth between the cycle. But I don't think that there's a, a any kind of linkage that says it's going to happen. But going the other way, so drug addiction certainly predisposes people to process addictions. If they already have a drug addiction and they have a genetic predisposition for a process addiction, there's a higher likelihood they're going to pick that up. <laughs>